Well, welcome to uh, the joint meeting during the summer of the Cabinet and the Borough Board. We welcome everybody here. Can we go around the room and identify those who are representing elected officials? Uh, I appreciate it. Oh, City Plant, sorry. Anybody re uh, representing electeds? Anybody else? No? Okay, we have Council uh, Member Adrian Adams is with us tonight and Council Member Danny Drum. We're gonna go through, so EDC knows, uh, we're gonna go through the uh, Bartlett Dairy. There is a vote on that tonight. We will do our best to get a quorum of the, of the council members uh, at the same time, but either way, we're gonna allow um, the votes to come and, and as the project finishes. Okay, that way you don't have to wait for everybody else. Okay. They had a conference. Okay, so we appreciate that the district managers and the um, chairs are here, and we look forward to hearing from EDC. So why don't we start? The New York City Economic Development Corporation works to make New York City the global model for inclusive innovation and economic growth, fueled by the city's diverse people and businesses. With teams of skilled and dedicated individuals with expertise amongst fields, New York City Economic Development promotes and grows quality jobs for all New Yorkers. With us tonight is Casey Peterson, uh, Government Relations from the New York City uh, EDC to present the pr proposed dip is des dip. Sorry, I speak for a living. Proposed disposition of city-owned property near JFK Airport to Bartlett Dairy Inc. for use as a distribution facility. Bartlett Dairy Inc. is a family-owned business with roots in Jamaica. Following this presentation, a vote will be taken amongst the Queen's delegation of the New York City Council members and the chair of Community Board 13. Where is he here? Didn't see him. Great. Now I don't see Clive, that's what I'm asking. Oh, so a hero? Sorry, I apologize, I thought they switched, I thought they switched you out. So let me say that again. On behalf of New York City EDC, is a hero Marda, um, who is the project manager for the Bartlett Dairy. And this is a 384B for everybody here, I'm sure you know that, but just to clarify. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present the JFK North Bartlett Project. My name is Wafira Marta. I'm on the Government and Community Relations team at EDC, and I am joined by my colleagues, Mikael Ababa and Jennifer Cohen from EDC, as well as Joseph Pakin and Diana Malave from the Bartlett team. The purpose of this presentation is to provide an overview of the business terms of the Bartlett Dairy Distribution Project and garner support from the Queens Borough Board as we seek the 384B4 approval. So a few details about the site. The project is located where Nassau Expressway and Rockaway Boulevard meet, just to the north of JFK. The size of the parcel of land is 8.7 acres, of which 6.15 acres would be disposed of to Bartlett Dairy, and the remaining 2.6 acres would remain under city ownership. It is located in an industrial zone, just outside of an industrial business improvement district, uh, and the closest bordering communities are Springfield Gardens and Jamaica, Queens. The site is currently mapped as an unbuilt portion of the Nassau Expressway, and the ULERP action uh, was required for the demapping and disposition. So, just uh, again for some local context, in the surrounding area there's very limited access to public transportation with mainly commercial uses on Rockaway Boulevard. The site is also very oddly shaped. So this project aimed to meet several policy goals, including uh, create an industrial and or commercial space near the JFK IBID. This previously unbuilt space will be activated and create significant economic opportunity. It will support job intensive uses, uh, responsibly deliver on a comprehensive hiring and wage program, and contribute to the local and regional economy. 
So some background information about Bartlett Dairy and Food Service. Uh, Bartlett Dairy was selected as the developer for this project following a competitive RFEI in 2015. Bartlett is really a beautiful story of New York City entrepreneurship. Um, they are a New York-based, minority-owned, family-run dairy and dry goods distribution company, um, and they've been located in Queens since 1968. Bartlett was formerly located in Elmhurst Dairy in Jamaica, Queens, but was displaced uh, and had to move back to the, move their facility to Newark. We are really looking forward to bringing them back home to Queens, where their roots are. They deliver dry and perishable goods to schools, hotels, groceries, restaurants, amongst others. Um, and their largest contracts do include the New York City Department of Education, the Archdiocese, and Starbucks. Bartlett employs about 500 people across three locations in Jamaica, Newark, and Rochester. Most of the jobs are concentrated in Newark currently, uh, but with this project, Bartlett will be bringing back 165 jobs to Queens from Newark. So here is a rendering of the site, uh, 54,050 square feet on 6.15 acres, including a truck repair shop. Bartlett is committed to planting 35 trees on the site, as you can see, um, and trucks will be making deliveries during the off-peak hours, so roughly uh, between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. as to not disturb the community. So some of the key deal terms, uh, Bartlett Dairy Inc. is the purchaser at a price of $4 million. This includes the 6.15 acres of land and only 55,750 square feet of development rights. So the remaining development rights will be vested with the adjacent <laughs> 2.6 acres of city-owned land. The deed includes a 25-year use restriction, specifically 10 years to dairy distribution and 15 years to industrial. They will receive IDA benefits and Empire State Development benefits. And so you all are aware, there are several site constraints um, to be aware of, including a Con Edison substation, a national grid gas main, and a DOT easement. The workforce development piece of the project is one we are extremely excited about. When Bartlett was previously located in Queens, their makeup was 50% Queens residents and 86% New York City residents. They are aiming to bring back similar numbers. Um, they will retain 165 existing jobs with average wages of approximately $70,000, create approximately 70 to 90 construction jobs, and provide extensive training and career ladder for employees. Um, they will also utilize Hire NYC for local recruitment, um, and they have a 25% um, WBE business hiring goal for the design and construction needs. So Bartlett really has engaged with the community from the very beginning of the process with the help of the council member. In addition to the community board, they have met with several civics as well as the nearby IBID who are all supportive of the project. The project received full support from the community board and the borough president's office during ULERP. And on June 13th, the project received a supportive vote from the New York City Council. Bartlett is very excited to be back into the community, and they have committed to providing a scholarship fund to be used for local students. So this is our timeline. We are anticipating closing by the end of this year and for construction to begin thereafter, looking toward a winter 2020 completion. Thank you, and we look forward to your continued partnership. Uh, well, here, uh, I probably should remember this. How many acres is this again? Uh, 6.15 acres. And how many acres were they using at Elmhurst Dairy? We didn't have straight acres. We had a building. Can you just identify yourself? Uh, just a Hi. We had a building at Elmhurst which had a warehouse and also offices. I think that was about 30,000, 35,000 square feet. And then we had parking. So we didn't have parking for probably 90 trucks. But we didn't have it listed in acreage. We just had spots. Okay. So I can't answer that. So you know, right. we're building a roughly 45,000 foot building <coughs> and parking for trucks. So it's, it's fairly similar. I'm asking more because of Elmhurst area than I am about this, just so you know. So well, Elmhurst was much larger. No, no, it's 16 acres, but I just was wondering how much room you were taking up. Okay. Questions? Bing? You mentioned something about taking uh, all of the master of the express way of taking the land. What happens to the master of the So 
this is listed on the it was listed on the city map as an unbuilt portion of the Nassau Expressway, so it's a completely overgrown site. So we're just correcting the city map to reflect the development. So that means the No, there were previous plans like a long time ago that were never moved on. Um, so yeah, we're going to be adjusting the city map to reflect development. <laughs> I think the goal is a minimum. If they are able to do more, then, then I'm confident that Bartlett will do that. Have you uh, gone over like a hiring, any extra employees coming in with this? So potentially, <clears throat> they're not 100% sure what the numbers will be, um, but the council member has been extremely involved in making sure that we're connected with the local civics, um, the uh, workforce development centers, just building relationships now. So as things come down the pipeline, we'll make sure that they're aware. Council Member Adrian Adams. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to let everyone that this proposal did come through my committee, and um, Council Member Richards is on his way. There are a lot of amenities, a lot of things that Bartlett is going to be doing within the community uh, and surrounding area that do have to do with MWBE, that have to do with community involvement, because we pretty much mandated those things going into this proposal. And uh, Bartlett uh, generously agreed to pretty much all of the terms that were set before them for the benefit of Southeast Queens. So I just wanted to throw that out there to let everybody know and to be assured that we did put all of our best interests in the community into this project to make sure that the community was well represented and taken care of within this proposal. And Council Member Richards will have the details, I'm sure. He will be more than happy to share the details. He's on his way and he's also indicated his support. I know, so um, any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna hold the vote on this until we have more council members, because a lot of them are on their way. So if you don't mind yeah. holding on, that would be great. I'm not gonna close this, this um, meet on its item because uh, the councilman will want to um, express his thoughts on it. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. But thank we are going to so start much. the next item. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. New York City Housing Preservation and Development, established in 1978, HPD is the largest municipal housing preservation and development agency in the nation. The agency's mission is to promote the quality and affordability of the city's housing stock. Casey Peterson. Yes, Casey Peterson. Uh, Resiliency Planner, Office of Neighborhood Strategies, uh, is here tonight to present the proposed acquisition and disposition of Hurricane Sandy storm damaged properties. Following this presentation, a vote will be taken amongst the Queen's delegation of the New York City Council members and the chairs of community boards 10 and 14. Council member Ulrich is on his way. He's about 10 minutes out, by the way. Please. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Peterson, Resiliency Planner at HPD. Um, I'm here to present a ULERP that consists of three actions, acquisition, disposition, and site selection for 74 scattered sites across community boards 10 and 14. Uh, this is related to Hurricane Sandy recovery and the Build It Back program. Uh, through Build It Back, the vast majority of homeowners stayed in their homes through the repair or rebuild pathway, but a small percentage, 100, about 126 homeowners, uh, opted for the acquisition and buyout program in which um, our nonprofit partner, Project Rebuild, purchased properties. Uh, to either convert into open space or redevelop as housing. It is funded by the HUD Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program. Um, and the ULERP will essentially allow us to 
follow through on the disposition plan, um, either converting these sites into open space or rebuilding them as resilient housing. So we have presented to community boards 10 and 14, um, haven't received the final recommendation from 14, but I believe both have approved with conditions. Um, and we were just here last week presenting um, at the borough president hearing, so I believe you're pretty familiar, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. This has also come up quite a bit on the hurricane task force. Um, just so everyone's aware of that. So this is not new to us, um, but it might be new to others. So if you have a question, please let me know. Okay. Vinny. How many properties and where are they located? So there's 74 properties. Um, let's see. In Community District 10, um, we have 31. Yeah, so they're mostly in Ramblersville, Hamilton Beach, Howard Beach. Uh, in Community Board 10, and then in 14, Broad Channel, and then uh, throughout the whole Rockaway Peninsula. Um, so we have four, four uh, fossils that are open space, so the Fox Department will be using it for resilience, building of the wetlands, and one of those lots are located. Then there are 26 lots that are being considered to go out expansion. So the small adjacent, large shaped lots adjacent to existing homes, and those are being offered uh, to the adjacent homes. There are 26, 20 are located in North Channel, one is located in Auburn, four in Engineer, and one in the Far Rockaway. There is also um, going to be on one property, Thompson, uh, according to the housing private, a private auction, so it's an empty lot, and we're going to private auction for the highest bidder, and they must build the stories um, The last item which the board has, uh, has asked for a traditional meeting, and at this time has not approved this, is the housing manager development RFP. And there are seven lots, one in Rockaway Park, one in Rockaway Beach, I'm sorry, two in, Rock, two in Rockaway Beach, one in Rockaway Park, one in Auburn, one in Engineer. And the plan is that these seven lots will be lumped together with an RFP and affordable housing will be built. So some of the board members had expressed concerns and inquiry as to why these lots would not be offered separate. Uh, to the individuals at the auction. And so at this time, um, there are some questions and further discussion necessary on those items. So the board is not uh, looking to move forward on that approval, but certainly on the open space, the yard expansion, and the part of auction, there is no more support for it. You're done? Uh, uh, Betty Brown? Instead of within Board 10, the bulk of them are within the Rangers and uh, some will become wetlands. Uh, others, we had a number of concerns that we could discuss yeah. uh, regarding the yard expansion and the yard benefits. Some were in the past already in all these properties throughout that area. Uh, not yet.
And there's been a lot of discussion about this, just FYI, about how it works, you know, which properties, all of that, the, the value of them, all of it. Um, any other questions? The councilman is five minutes away, so we, we're not going to close the item. So if you can just stay until we can get one vote for both items, that would be very helpful. Sure. Okay. Next, we're going to get an update. Uh, and a briefing on the 2020 census. As many of you know, we've been very involved uh, with creating a Queens Complete Count Committee. Uh, we are working with the U.S. Census Bureau uh, on that. We know that a lot of our civics are really involved with the Count Committee, and we um, encourage that to happen, especially different uh, language speakers, uh, people in different neighborhoods. We want to make sure that we have people in every neighborhood doing this. We want people in every language doing this. We want to make sure that every single person is counted, uh, especially since, uh, you know, we are a little more comfortable now with the U.S. Census um, form. And we appreciate you being here. May I present Jeff Beller, uh, Director of the New York Regional Office. Thank you very much. And let me start off with a, a special thank you to President Katz and your leadership. The tireless efforts of your staff, which have been phenomenal. Uh, we are leading, Queens is leading the region as far as our recruiting efforts go. And that's no doubt to the work of, of you and your staff. So thank you very much for, for all your support. Thank you. So again, my name is Jeff Baylor, a Regional Director for the New York Region. It's one of six regions we have across the country who are responsible for all census uh, activities. We cover all of New York, New Jersey, all the way up through Maine, all the, the uh, New England states and Puerto Rico. So that's our ter territory for 2020. Before I jump into 2020, I would do want to mention we are out there knocking on doors every day collecting very important information. You may hear about the unemployment rate that comes out the first Friday of every month. We collect that data for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, who then releases the unemployment rate. Housing starts, consumer price index, crime and disease. We collect data for the uh, Center for Disease Control. I mention this because there will be scams when 2020 rolls around. We've already seen some this month. Uh, some people put the word census on the top of a form. They list some questions and say, send your check for $10 in. Or very, very uh, reputable um, organizations do the same thing. They put a, a census questionnaire to try to get data because people see the word census and they think that's the official census. So I ask, please reach out to us if you see anything that doesn't look right. We never ask for money, never. We never ask for social security numbers. We never ask for bank account or credit card information. If you see that in relation to census, it's a scam. Okay, but please reach out to us. We'll do all the research. We'll let you know if it's a legitimate survey that you or one of your constituents may be receiving, uh, and um, our partnership staff will work directly with you. Before I forget, Jamal Baksh. Jamal, if you want to come in and wave your hand. If you haven't met Jamal yet, you need to. Uh, he is a partnership specialist working in the Queens area. He's got some great information. He's got a table set up out there. Please grab some information if you can. Jeff, anyway, before you yeah. go on, you're talking yeah. about the fraud, fraud issue. Is there any phone calls? So some of our surveys do involve telephone calls, but typically you will get something in the mail letting you know that uh, we're trying to reach you. Or it's one of our longitudinal surveys where we visit you over maybe eight, eight, an eight-month period. We'll visit you multiple times. You'll know we're calling you. So for even for the 2020 census, you should not expect direct calls from the census. There will be a handful, but but uh, not the majority. Betty? Absolutely. We can definitely do that. But the, it's important to note that the U.S., because, you know, I get calls where they know, like, my electric bill last month, right, and, uh, and they know exactly to the penny, and it's not Con Edison. But it's important for our constituents to know they will never ask for money. And I think almost as important, they will never ask for your Social Security That's number. Correct. Yep. Right? Not Absolutely. even the last four digits. Never. That's really important. Yep. So we need to make sure people aren't giving that info over the phone, especially. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, we've been joined by Council Member Karen Kozlowitz as well, and we're waiting on Donovan Richards and Eric Ulrich. They'll be here in about a minute. Okay. So regarding the 2020 census, people ask us, is your job to ensure states don't lose congressional seats? Is your job to ensure cities reach a certain population? No. Our job is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. And I'll talk about how we do that. 
So again, Article 1, Section 2 mandates that every 10 years in the years ending in zero, we conduct a complete count of the nation's population and housing. All right, everyone living in the United States. We don't care whether they're here legally or illegally, we care that they get counted. All right, and why? I'm going to talk about the representation that's based upon census data, and most importantly, federal funding that your communities use every day. Okay? Two things we always ask from, from our partners. First is jobs. Even though the census is a national event, in order to be successful, we have to conduct it at the local level, meaning we have to hire people to work in their own neighborhoods. We'll be opening four offices in Queens. We need clerical staff to work in those offices. We need supervisors to work in those offices. We need managers to work in those offices. The majority of jobs or the positions that we hire for will be for short-term temporary work, usually eight to 12 weeks per operation. We have four to five operations you can work on over the next year and a half. So people do string all five operations if they'd like to. Maybe if the, the time of the year isn't right, maybe they'll turn one down now. But the next time we call them for the next operation, uh, they can accept the position. We pay $25 here in Queens. Paid training, mileage, and transit reimbursement while on duty. Pay $25. You can be successful working for us part-time. You don't have to quit your jobs. You can work nights and weekends and be successful as a census representative. So please share the information. You'll see there, 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. That's how you apply for jobs this time around. There's information on the table out there. Please disseminate that. Share the information that there's job opportunities available. I can tell you our recruiting goal for Queens is just shy of 10,000 for the 2020 census. Uh, and right now we're at a little over 4,000 recruited. Which Jeff, we have a question by Councilmember uh, Danny Drum, and we've yes. also been joined by Councilmember Donovan Richards. Well, thank you very much. I just, um, actually, I probably could have went to the end, but um, a neighbor of mine received um, an American um, community, community survey, survey. Right? Mm -hmm. and they're yeah. very confused about this being the census or the other thing. Is there any way the Census Bureau can clarify to people what it is that they're receiving because um, there's a lot of fear in the community? about these things and it's very confusing to people. Yeah, that, that definitely has to be a part of our messaging. We have information on our website. Um, we're looking to develop some flyers and materials that we can give to our community leaders that they can pass out to let people know about on, that. On American, uh, on American Community Survey, yeah. Absolutely. So, so I just understood. One of you continue your presentation will save questions for the end. Okay. Uh, and uh, the items the Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so jobs are out there. Please share the information that, that jobs are available. The second thing we're asking is all of you are community leaders. People look to you for education, for validation. They come to you with questions. We're asking all of you to start the conversation now about the census. And that conversation is easy. We say the census is safe, the census is easy, and the census is important. And I'll go over those three things now. The census is safe. Title 13 which uh, took effect in the 1950s, protects every piece of data we collect. By law, we cannot release information that would identify an individual or a household, period. Local, state, federal law enforcement cannot access our data. Homeland Security, INS, cannot access our data. The Patriot Act does not supersede Title 13. In addition, everyone who works on a census takes an oath for life, whether you work one day or 30 years. Basically, if I were to release information that were to identify an individual or a household, I could be in prison for up to five years, fined for up to $250,000. So we take data security very seriously. All right, so the census is safe. Census is easy, four ways to respond this time around. First time ever you'll be able to respond online. In addition, this is the first time you'll be able to call a toll-free number and give your information over the phone. We've always had toll-free telephone support in the past, but we've never collected information. So if you or your community members want to call your information in, again, we're not calling you, but you can call us. You can provide your information over the phone. If you want to fill it out on paper, because that's what you've done the past five censuses, you'll have that opportunity as well. So those three ways, online over the phone and on paper we call self-response. That is the highest quality data we ever collect on a census, is when you're in control of filling it out, uh, sending it back in. The fourth way 
that we count people, which will begin in May of 2020. We'll start knocking on doors of every address in which we haven't received a census form. In 2010, we hired over 600,000 people nationwide for that eight-week operation. We're anticipating about 400 to 500,000 people nationwide. All right, we'd love to get that lower. What are we asking? Name, age, date of birth, your race and origin, Hispanic origin. Pay no attention to that citizenship. That's been determined it will not be on the 2020 census. Your relationship to the first person listed on the form, mother, father, son, daughter. Tenure, whether you own or rent your home. And then we have some oper operational questions. Reminders about making sure you're including everyone or you're not including someone you shouldn't, like a college student who's living away. Okay, that's all we ask. That's what this census is. Nothing more than those those categories listed there. All right, so the census is easy. This gives you a quick timeline of our mail out. We're going to do five mail outs for the census. All right, the very first mail out will begin the week of beginning March 12th. All right, the majority of the country, 80% of the country, that first mail out, you're going to have the URL basically 2020census.gov. You're gonna have your census ID, which is just a 12-digit unique identifier that takes place of your address. And then you're gonna get a list of 13 different telephone numbers, and I'll talk about 13 here in shortly. Okay, that's it, you're not getting a paper questionnaire. We're trying to get people to fill it out online, to call their information and over the phone, all right? If you don't wanna do that, that fourth mail out, which you see is April 8th through the 16th, if we haven't received a response from you, we will send you a paper questionnaire. So every household that wants to fill it out on paper will have that opportunity. The other 20% of the nation are gonna get that same initial package, but it will also include a paper questionnaire. And those are in areas with no or very little internet connectivity. All right, we're giving them a questionnaire right away. So online starts March 12th. That's when you can actually take an action and start filling out your form or calling a toll-free number, or if you receive a paper questionnaire, fill it out. We'll continue collecting data, both self-response and knocking on doors through the end of July of 2020. So that's the period to be counted, mid-March through the end of July. I mentioned 13 different telephone numbers, both online and our telephone system will support English and those 12 non-English languages. So for English and Spanish, when you call the toll-free number, you will be directed to an IVR system. I'll ask you what specifically you're looking for. For the other 11 languages, an operator will pick up the phone and answer, your, you know, answer in that native language. Any questions you may have, and if you want to give your information over the phone, you'll be able to do that. Those 12 languages plus English make up 99% of the responses we receive on a census. We certainly know there's a lot more languages than 12, 13. So what happens? With the, if you call a, a Russian number and, and they, they don't understand you, uh, I, I don't know that they're gonna be able to do anything. That, Yeah, so what we're going to have um, in the kind of the third column, we're going to have a total of 59 non-English language guides. So while the form won't be available in that language, we're going to provide you with directions on how to fill out the form in that native language. It, it, there's 59. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a numbers game as far as budget and the threshold that they looked at. The next language, I just learned this last week, the next language that would have been included after those, those 12 would be Italian. That's the next most populous language in which a questionnaire, but it didn't meet the threshold. Yeah, yeah. So again, online and over the phone will be available in English and 12 non-English languages, okay? So that was it's easy, it's important. So we all know congressional, or you may not know, congressional representation, how many seats each state has in the US Congress is based upon census data. Electoral college is based upon census data. So if we miss people, your area will not get the representation it deserves. States use census data for their redistricting, for their voting precincts, for their school districts. 
But one of the most important things that we've heard from our community-based organizations is that over $675 billion of federal funding is disseminated every year based upon census data. National School Lunch Program, Highway Planning and Construction, Medicaid, SNAP, WIC, uh, you see some other Title I grants. Many, many programs that affect each community. And we get one chance every 10 years to make sure we get the data correct. So if there's community members who choose not to fill it out, or they don't understand and, and, and they refuse to fill it out, their community will be affected, their state will be affected, the county will be affected, the borough will be affected for the next 10 years. This is our one opportunity to get it right, so we have to make sure we get everyone counted. So just give you a brief timeline. Education phases now. So we're out there doing events like this. Jamal and, and the other partnership specialists throughout Queens. We're going to churches. We're going to community events. Anything you want us at to talk about the census, whether it's uh, sitting at a table handing out information, whether it's making a presentation, we'll do it. All right? Awareness phase will start in January. That's when our paid media starts. That's when you'll start seeing advertisements about, hey, the census is coming. Did you know it's safe? Do you know why it's so important for your community? Do you know how easy it will be to fill out your form this time around? We'll start our motivation phase in March because that's when you can take action. That's when you can go online, call your information over the phone, fill out your paper questionnaire. We'll have a reminder phase starting in May because that's when we're going to start knocking on doors. So, again, it's not too late to go online and self-respond. All right, and then a thank you phase at the end. So what can you do right now? Share the job information. If you want to host an event where you invite your community members in, we'll provide the staffing. Uh, uh, Queens had a, just an awesome event, had over 400 people come in and apply for a job. And we, I think we sent 20, 20 or so staff. They had a, a whole boatload of staff. It's just a wonderful event. Start the census conversation. Safe, easy, important. Become a partner. If you have a, a, a business card or contact information, make sure you get it. Jamal will get into, into our system, get our newsletters. See, uh, You'll have access to all the materials uh, available on our site, a lot of pamphlets, flyers, one-pagers that you can download and print, or you can request from us. If you want us to print a whole bunch for you to put in an office or take to an event, we'd be more than happy to do that. If you haven't uh, started a CCC, which I, I know we have here in Queens, um, but there's also community boards that start CCCs. There's churches that start CCCs. There's neighborhood buildings that start CCCs. Just a group of people who understand the challenges for whatever geography they're covering and work together on what's the right message, who's the right messenger, to ensure we get everyone counted. And then identify opportunities. Again, anything. A tabling event. You just want us to come and talk for five minutes. Uh, if you want to host a job fair or a recruiting event, you let us know and we will support Lastly, just a couple tools that are available. If you haven't seen this, CUNY put together this great uh, hard to count maps 2020 where they're looking at the self response rates from 2010. So, how many people who received the form in the mail filled it out and sent it back in? And they're using that to project what they think each area will, will their self response rate will be for 2020. Okay? We've done the same thing, but we've added in some additional information. For instance, we know the fastest growing undercounted group in the nation are children under the age of five. Renters are typically undercounted. Foreign born, people who speak a language other than English at home. So we take that data that we have available and put it into a formula to try to determine where the hard to count areas are. So all those little pieces of land on there are what we call census tracts. It's the smallest geography that you can use where we don't have to mass the data. Because remember, when we release our data, we cannot release it if it identifies an individual or a household. So these census tracts are usually anywhere from two to 8,000 people on average. The darker shade of the track, the more difficult we believe it will be for people to self-respond in 2020. All right? It's available at census.gov forward slash Rome. I picked out a track here in Queens with that little white dot in it, that little piece there. That uh, population is a little over 8,000, 8,227 people live in that little geography there. And we believe, if you see the very first line, low response score, that 30.9% of the households in that little geography will not self-respond. They won't go online. 
They won't call it in over the phone. They won't fill it out on paper. All right. And then in addition, we have a whole bunch of data about all the households in that particular census tract. You can see those who only have smartphones or with no computing device, broadband internet access or no internet access, the languages that are spoken in those homes. So we're using this information to make sure we're hiring people with the correct skill sets, language, uh, uh, education, experience with certain uh, uh, communities. And we're also using this, if we're gonna spend money for recruiting ads or for anything, we're gonna spend it in these areas that are considered hard to enumerate or hard to count. All right, so this is out there. We have trainings. Jamal can uh, walk you through a, a training on this, but it, it, it's a great way to kind of learn about your particular community. All right. Lastly, I'll mention we do have a data dissemination program that teaches you about all the tools we have available. One of the great things they do is a grant writing workshop. We don't teach you how to write a grant, we teach you how to find that very specific piece of data to tell your story. And selfishly, if people see how our data is being used, I think they'll be much more likely to fill out this, their census when they get it. Sure. We can, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. All right, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to do this if I can. Uh, I'd like to interrupt to just do yep. the vote if I can. Please. And then answer questions if that's all right with everybody. Um, the first is a 384B vote, so we want to hold it open. Uh, Bob Holden is on his way. We will hold it open so that we have the proper numbers that are needed for the 384B. Um, the, we need a motion to dispose of the property to Bartlett Dairy. It is a uh, it is a property disposition of city-owned property near JFK Airport to Bartlett Dairy for use as a distribution facility. Uh, I have uh, comments by Donovan Richards, council member. First off, let me thank Bartlett and let me thank uh, EDC and all of the partners that really got us here today. Um, uh, Clive Williams, Community Board 13, um, Renee, Community Board uh, 12, um, thank you, Spring Jam Block Association, EDC. You know, we talk about manufacturing jobs all the time in the city, and what we really are doing here is really historic, especially for the neighborhoods adjacent to uh, the specific site in Springfield Gardens as we speak. You know, we always talk about bringing jobs back to Queens, and this is clearly a great project that is going to ensure that we can bring hundreds of jobs, uh, not just back to Queens, but for the neighborhoods that certainly have been impacted um, the most when it comes to, well, disproportionately when it comes to um, job opportunities. So I'm very happy to know that we secured a 50% local hiring uh, goal here. Um, MWBE I'm happy with, although I know my colleagues and I always want to see more. We look forward to continuing to work with you on that. Um, and then scholarship money for Springfield High School students, which is going to be important in ensuring that they can um, receive higher education, or at least pay down on some textbooks. Um, and then the repaving of Rockaway uh, Boulevard, which is good, um, all the way up to Brookfield Boulevard, which is sorely needed. There still are a lot of DOT issues. I know we were out at the site this week, um, and I want to continue to work with EDC and DOT, specifically on this, on this, in this area. Um, with that being said, um, listen, it's a great day for Southeast Queens whenever we can bring these opportunities back to people. I know that you've been out to the local shelter over there as well. We look forward to a strong partnership with local organizations as well so that we can ensure that all the job promises that were made can be kept and that there is a tracking mechanism, which I know you're going to do for five years as well. So with that being said, I want to thank my colleagues for coming in here uh, in the summer um, and thank you all for, for the work in getting us here. I, I uh, certainly urge everybody to vote aye on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Richards. Uh, the voters, the people who are going to vote today are Community Board 13 uh, and the Council Members. So, do I hear a motion to approve the disposition of the property to Bartlett Dairy? Call on Clive Williams. Yes, I am. All right, do I hear a second? Second. Uh, Vicki will call the roll. 
for 13, Clive Williams. Yes. Councilmember Donovan Richards. I happily vote aye. Councilmember Adrian Adams. I vote aye. Councilmember Denise Miller. Yes, it looks like my vote. <laughs> yeah. So this is a project that is that is long coming. I think about five years ago. High school in the city. Um and, and private and a project long coming. Uh, about five years ago this started, EDC came in and wanted to talk about it, but even uh, uh, further than that when the jobs left Jamaica. And that was a devastating loss. And, and so to bring them back, I want to thank my, my colleagues here, Councilmember Richards, for doing his due diligence and ensuring that we bring back good union jobs to our community that is the backbone of who we are. Um, and, and aside from providing the services, um, critical services to our young people, DOE and the others uh, that they provide, really excited about it and how we were able to leverage the additional opportunities for the community is really special and it really took a team effort so thank you for allowing me to be a part of the team sir and as a labor chair i'm absolutely ecstatic that we were able to bring these jobs back home thanks i vote aye Okay, and the vote will remain open. Right. Is Councilmember Holden walking down the hall? No. Okay, we're going to go to the. We're going to leave that open, and we're going to go to the next vote. Uh, we next. Wait, wait, wait! Don't run! No, no, no! We have one more vote. Okay. <laughs> um, we next. We next are going to do a, uh, a vote for the acquisition and disposition of Hurricane Sandy Storm damaged property. Um, the presentation has already been made. The community boards who can vote on this are 10 and 14 and the Queen's delegation. So do I hear a motion to approve the acquisition and disposition of these properties? Yes. Betty, Chair Betty Bratton? Tomorrow's police found on the exception. So, um, with the exception of the seven lots earmarked for housing redevelopment, there needs to be further community board. Okay. Okay. okay, so with the exception of the seven properties, which are listed where? Housing redevelopment RFP. Okay, so of the housing redevelopment RFP. Okay, with the exception of those seven properties. So Betty Bratton has made a motion. Okay, we have a second with the amendment. Please call the roll. Okay. Community Board 10, Betty Bratton. Yes. Community Board 14, Laura Swartz. Yes. Community Board 15, Jeff Hall. Yes. Community Board 16, Jeffrey Hall. I uh, just want to add something to that. Any um, properties, and I know we're going to get into further discussion, I know I have a meeting at the council tomorrow on this, um, just want to stress any redevelopment should entertain community land trust models if you're going to redevelop any lots, uh, especially back in Edgemere. So I just wanted to put that out there, but I'm going to vote aye today. Councilmember Janique Miller? Vote aye. Council Adrian Adams? I vote aye. We will also leave those votes open. We thank uh, the council members for being here tonight. We know it's the middle of the summer and you still are working hard at the council. So we thank you for being here. So Jeff, you're back on. All right. Um, any questions, Laura Sora? So can you share with us how you're going to count the homeless and is it based on your temporary or is it based on your current or their intake? Yeah, that's a great question. So with uh, part of our group quarters operation, so group quarters are uh, jails, prisons, um, college dormitories that are on campus, of course, uh, uh, nursing homes. So we have a whole operation where we work one-on-one -on -one with those administrators. A piece of that is the homeless. So over a three-day period at the end of March, because all the questions on a census form ask about April 1st, we're, we're taking a snapshot in time. 
Um, so we ask you where you lived as of a, did you live at this address as of April 1st? So over a three day period, we're gonna visit every mobile food van, every soup kitchen, every homeless shelter. We're gonna work with the local leaders in those communities, with those administrators of those services. What's the best day, what's the best time? So we'll come there and we'll do a head count. If we can collect additional information, we will. Also, starting in, in a couple months, our partnership program is gonna work with local leaders and community-based organizations that serve the homeless population to start to list all the locations where someone who's experiencing homelessness could be staying if they're not staying in a shelter. So, you know, on the church steps behind the, the local Duane Reed. Uh, and we're gonna collect a list of all those uh, sites and then either on the night of March 30th or the uh, night of March 31st, we're gonna go out in teams and do a head count. Yeah, so uh, uh, the partnership program is probably the most important thing we do on a census and, and the partnership program part of it is the trusted voices. So while I'll go out, Jamal will go out, all our partnership staff will go out to any community to talk about the census, that it's safe, it's easy, it's important. We certainly understand that it's your voice that's more important, or it's the voice of their church leader, or the voice of their, their favorite restaurant, whoever that trusted voice is. That's what we're working on now. And we talk about Title 13. We have a great, and uh, hopefully Jamal has it out there, a confidentiality one-pager that basically explains it in non-lawyer-like speak that every piece of data that's being provided to the Census Bureau can't be shared with anyone else, period. You know, we can't share it, again, local, state, federal law enforcement, Homeland Security, INS, Patriot Act does not supersede Title 13. We've been challenged by numerous administrations and uh, agencies over the past seven decades to try to get access to our data, and we've won in federal court every time. So that's one of our talking points that we're talking about. That, 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 Yeah. 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 Well, and, and again, our response, I, I don't know necessarily that we're the right person to come up with the answer. I think we have to work together on what that answer is for each individual community. Our goal is to create a toolbox of messages to kind of learn what makes sense for that particular community you may be, may be talking about. Who is that trusted voice? And, and that's what we want to do right now, have that conversation. So clearly that's not strong enough, but, but what is? Let's sit down and talk about it to figure out what can that message be? Who is that trusted messenger? We are trying to, in the Queens County uh, Count Committee, try to give that trust out and try to work with the individual leaders of each community. Um, I do think it's going to be an uphill battle. I mean, especially a lot of the languages we speak are just not on your list. I mean, just not on the list, right? So we're not only telling them that it's safe, then we're saying, but you can't, you can't answer it in the questions, so just trust us that you're answering the right place at the right, you know, the right answer at the right place. Um, and, and I guess Florence is going to be next, but just, is there any way, and I know this is probably a no, but is there any, like, safety net at all? Like, what if the numbers come back, which are clearly wrong? Like, what if Queens shows an undercount of what you expected by a mass amount, because I'm just telling you that's gonna happen, yeah. right? And we don't want it to happen, we're gonna make sure it doesn't, but if it does, is there any way? This is really it, this is the official count. We get one chance every 10 years. Now there are uh, what they call a special census program that starts usually in the years two and after, where if cities choose to fund a special census, we can conduct a special census. Uh, and I wanna mention one thing you mentioned regarding the languages. That's why it's so important now we are recruiting in those areas, those communities of those languages that aren't covered. So we're hiring those people to serve as translators for us. They're on our staff. 
there are partnership specialists, they're working directly with those community leaders. So if there's concerns of specific languages that, that you see that we don't have covered, we have to make sure we get out there and recruit and hire those people to work for us. Florence, can we vote um, one? In our and then Mark? district and community board, one Keith and all of Western Queens, in the last census we were completely undercounted to the point that our census count shows that we were going from 210,000 citizens to 177 citizens in one of the fastest growing communities in the world. Community Board 2 has the highest growth rate higher than any other state in the country of the United States. Our numbers are going down. We have Greek, we have Italian, we have Bengali. In Community Board 1, we are the most diverse community in the city of New York. We have 115 languages spoken in my district. <laughs> Those are fighting words around here. <laughs> If you look at the numbers, we went from 215,000 down to 177, which is physically impossible because of the number of housing developments being built in our district. We have Queensbridge North, Queensbridge South, Woodside Houses, Astoria Houses, Ravenswood. Queensbridge is the largest in the nation. There was no penetration with the census. There is no way from what you're saying here at this table tonight, our numbers are going to be correct. I can tell you that right now. And you're coming to us as a community board. Most of us have three to four employees, and you're telling us go out there and help you. We have three to four employees with massive growth going out through this borough. We need you to give us the tools. We need you to work with the Facebook, with the Twitter, with the paper, with the public documents. You have to be on the trains. You have to do that. You can't expect us so, to do that. So just so you know, we've been working uh, hand in hand with the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. And I, I think that they are as best effort as they can be in trying to work with us. But we, we are trying to make up for whatever they can't do, right? Because we know our neighborhoods better than anybody else. So we've done... Uh, what is it, three job fairs? We've done a town hall, we've done a job fair, we've done a public hearing. We had our first meeting of the Queen's uh, Complete Count Committee uh, in January of 2018. Um, I will say this though, the, the one problem that we are facing is that you hire only documented individuals, correct? But the city, my understanding, is will hire everyone. Is that correct? I, I'm not sure on, on what the, the, the city's hiring uh, restrictions are. I will tell you that we are seeking the flexibilities that we had in 2010, which would allow us to hire non-citizens. So we're, we're seeking those same flexibilities. We haven't received the approval yet from, from uh, uh, Office of Management and Budget, but we're anticipating we will. And all of these, much to Florence's question, all of these community groups you want to work with, are we funding them at all? We do, we do not have the ability to give funds out. The federal government doesn't have the ability to give funds out. So my understanding is New York State has $20 million towards this and New York City has $26 million towards this. Um, Susie? Yeah. Do we know how community groups apply for this money? Or do they not? Okay, so just so everybody knows, there is money allocated towards this uh, for our community groups. Uh, and we are waiting for the mayor and the governor's office to give us direction on how one applies for those funds in our communities. Okay? Mark McMillan. Yeah, I have a very simple question. I saw Please. one of your slides said that you're looking for phone numbers. Why do you need to send phone numbers? So it, on the census questionnaire, you of course list each person living at your address. And we also ask for a pop count. So let's say five, you, you just write in the number five people live here. But if you only list four names, we don't know what's correct. So we ask for a phone number in the event we need to call you due to a quality issue. That's the only reason we ask for, for phone numbers. Yeah. Hmm. It's just so we don't have to send someone to your door. We'd prefer to give you a call to ask, is there really five people living at the address or is there four? Betty Bratton, and then uh, Clive again. Absolutely. 
Yeah, they can go online or they can they can call the toll-free number. Now, uh, again, the, the, I must say the city of New York, the state of New York did a, uh, did a wonderful job in, in working with us during an operation that we do mid-decade. It's called the Local Update of Census Addresses. So one time a decade, well, we'll give you our address list. We gave the city of New York all the addresses and they could provide feedback. So which, which is correct. So there's a census ID. Remember I said there's census ID? If you don't have that ID, you can still go online, you can still call the toll-free number, you just need to give your address and the nearest cross streets so that again, it, we can look for that ID so when we release the data, we're releasing it in the correct place. Is that something that makes for a targeting thing? You know, here it means in every neighborhood, people are always concerned with, who's the stranger knocking on my door? Yeah. If we can do that the messaging thing, you don't want that stranger knocking at you. Pull up, pull up and yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's there, there's been discussion. I know here in the in the Queens uh, uh, borough and, and and other areas around New York City, a lot of these partners who are hosting these recruiting events, you know, they're doing it at libraries or community colleges, or they're bringing in tablets like they did here in Queens. They're also talking about when Census Day rolls around next next March April, have a similar type of event, but invite people to come in to fill out their census form and provide support there if people don't understand. And we can make sure people who speak that language, we have support it as well. Mm -hmm. Clive, Clive, Vinny, and then yeah. you Dolores. You are aware that you are by the American Family Surveys, right? Uh, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the, that survey. The American Community Survey? I was are you talking about the American Community Survey? I'm not. Not. Fa I, I know we have the American Community Survey. That's that's a Census Bureau. It, it was a long form back in Census 2000, but now we conduct it on a monthly basis. Yeah, I'd like to chat with you afterwards and try to get some details to, yeah, because that's not a survey that the Census Bureau conducts. Right, at least why don't, if it's why don't we take that about, offline yeah. afterwards? Yeah. Uh, so the extent to which it might mitigate the responses you get is yeah. something that you want to get. Yeah. 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 Vinny, then Dolores? Who will, will be getting the questionnaire of Every citizen or every household? Every, every address. We send a package to every address. I don't remember anything like that personally. Yeah, every address will get it, and there'll, there'll be up to five mailings per address. I remember that. And then we'll start knocking on doors of every address if we haven't received that response by, by May 13th. Ms. Orr? So I was just taking in terms of on census day And I will tell you, one of the initiatives that the Census Bureau is seeking funding for um, is for us to be able to be a little bit more mobile. So allow us to, to extend some of our staff to work directly with our partners. So if you say, okay, on Saturday, Jeff, can you send some of your team to this location with some tablets to allow people to come up and fill out the census form? So that's something we're, we're planning right now. But so not to be a smart plan. aleck, but who exactly does the U.S. Census apply to money from? Like from like Congress. From Congress. Yes. So it's not part of your expense budget, like these types. Of, they have to add money for this. Correct. That's correct. Our partnership program is part of the, the census, but the ability to to add some additional staff and purchase tablets would be an additional fund that was not in the baseline. Okay, I'm gonna take a break for a second and give the opportunity to Councilmember Holden, who's been briefed on the two items in front of us today. Um, Councilman Holden, how do you vote on the disposition of property to Bartlett Dairy, a 384B vote? 
and the uh, uh, we are going to close that item, right? We're done. Acquisition and disposition of Hurricane Sandy storm damaged properties. How do you vote? Yes. The item is closed. Yep. Uh, uh, Christian had a question. Betty Bratton? Yeah. The that the schools as you're doing this how are you doing that we are so we, we try to work first with the complete count committees we don't we don't want to step right. on any toes so if a complete count committee has a relationship with the school we try to get them on board whether they're part of the complete count committee or not we have a program called statistics in schools it's basically K through 12 where a teacher can download uh, materials to teach the class about the census to talk about all the different subjects we have materials we're going to be handing out maps things like that for school so okay. so absolutely but Betty's Betty's talking about something very different yeah. she's talking about actually getting them to fill it out on that particular day at the school and so my question is I mean if you're going to get folks to fill it out documented and undocumented one of the main places to do it is the schools especially if they're undercounted and especially now in Queens uh, in New York City we have 3k and 4k so that brings the yeah. right. So absolutely, we can do that. Yeah. So we can be helpful on that. But the question yeah. really is, if I go to a school in the morning and I say, "Did you fill out your census?" and they say, "No, I did not." What do I have to make sure that they do? Do I have anything that I can give them to fill it out right there? Is there? How does that work? Yeah, so it would, it, there would have to be some type of device, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's a computer at a, in the, the school library. Um, and then they could just go there and fill it out. And again, if they don't have their census ID, they would just key in their address in the nearest cross streets. Wait, I just want everyone to know here, by the way, that this gentleman has been very helpful with us. Um, in trying to reach out to different communities. And I know he's sort of in an auspicious uh, situation at the moment, but he has been trying to get our folks, you know, trusting folks to hire uh, and work with our office, uh, with Susie, with Sharon, with everybody here. Um, so I just, we thank you for thank that. You. I appreciate um, it. And we understand that you're in a, an odd yeah. spot. Um, but we are trying to point out to you what you can bring back to the central office. Queens is extremely distinct. And um, from the count of those languages, a large portion of us will not be able to fill out these census. And I'm not sure what the dynamic was 10 years ago. I forget what the numbers were back then, uh, as far as languages six. go. No, six. languages go. Like how many oh, different languages six, there six. was in Queens, right? I mean, yep. since I've been borough president in the last six years, it's gone from 120 countries to 200, 290 countries. Wow. It's gone from 130 languages to 200 languages. Yeah, as we do our trackers from city council every year. So just in my six years, it's increased exponentially. Um, and so it's going to be hard for us. Yeah. What? what? I have a question about Renata? development. You know, Western Queens again, and all of Queens as a matter of fact, has a tremendous amount of development and reconstruction. Those units that are entered today, are not necessarily going to be emptying a year, two years, three years now. How are they counted? How are the empty units allotted? Because we need fire department, police yep. department, sanitation for those empty units. And the census is where we're going to get our money. How are those empty units yeah. counted? A great question. So a couple things. First off, the census that we do every 10 years is a census of people and housing units. So we also count the number of housing units. That's part of our job during the census, whether it's vacant or occupied. Uh, we, we are collecting that information. 
We have a program called uh, New Construction, which all of our LUCA contacts have, all the, the, the government leaders should have, that allows communities to provide any addresses that they haven't included already uh, that they think will could be inhabited by April 1st, 2020. So again, our focus is on April 1st, 2020. If there's a unit that could be inhabited, we want to make sure, A, we count the unit, and if someone's living in there, we make sure we get them counted. So we may not have their address in our system, but that doesn't mean we can't get the message out to that building to say, hey, if you haven't gotten something in the mail, go online. Fill out the census form, just key in your address, or call one of these toll-free numbers. But here's the issue, like we, Rockaway, we have about 6,000 units that Yeah, it, it, not, not with the 2020 census because it is a snapshot at time. But we do population estimates programs, we do other things that are estimates, they're not an actual count throughout the decade. Yeah, I mean, and then we redistrict our borough, we redistrict the United States based on right. the census, right? So we'd be redistricting the people. And I understand, I wish there was some way that we could figure out how to do it. Maybe the answer is that the city or the state pays for the update on the census. You said we could do that like in two years or something like that. Yeah, it's a special census program. Yeah. Or Maybe basically we we'll come out back how out. That, how to do that. Since we're growing so rapidly, it might be something worthwhile for us to talk to the mayor's office about. And what I would su suggest too is, is let's see what this 2020 census count is because the population estimates program is based, the base of that is the 2020 census. So you will receive estimates on growth and things like that throughout the decade, but again, they're estimates. But we're not going to get money or elected officials based on it. Correct. Ms. English, did you have a question? I was asking, you mentioned that right now you hired 4,000. No, we, uh, we've recruited. So for over 4,000 people have applied to work for the Census Bureau. Our goal for Queens is just under 10,000. Any wind chimes, how nice. Uh, any other questions? I have a few questions just to finish up if I can. And I'm sorry if you've talked to my staff about this already. No, 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 and some of them I'm asking just for everybody else too. So my understanding is you've reached out to, the, we've all reached out from Susie, we've reached out to all of your boards. We've asked all of the chairs and the DMs to sit on our Queen's yeah. Complete Count Committee. So please, we would love it if you would partake you, can, you are in a very, very good position to give us the names of leaders in your community that you know are not being addressed. Like, uh, like we mentioned the Bangladesh community, the yep. Pakistan community, the Indian community. A lot of our communities are not up there. And you are in unique positions to be able to tell us who the leaders are and anybody on your community board that may be from those neighborhoods or those communities. So please, you know, do it with us, work with us. I know you are already, but just to throw that out there. We will look for the funding issue for the civic groups. Uh, we will look to see how, how the applications are done. Um, what happens, Jeff, and I don't know the answer to this because I've been told different things by different people. What if I just give my name, tell you know, how many people are living here, and I hand it in? So at, at the end of the day, you'll be counted. All right, well, we accept those forms. The more questions you leave unanswered, the higher probability that someone will come and knock on your door to, to try and collect that information. So about how much information do you need yeah, to count I, yeah. versus the knock on the door? It's a, it's a, it's a, that great, balance? It's a very popular question. I don't know what that threshold is that pushes it. I, I, can, tell, I can tell you historically, Historically, if there was a question that went unanswered on a census form, we typically did not spend the money to send someone out there to knock on their doors to collect that information. Half the forms not filled out, I would, I would guess, and this is just my, my guess, more than likely we're going to come and, and knock on your door to try and collect the remaining information. So what if we fill out, and this is just for my own information, what if we fill out, you know, John Smith living here with three kids? Is there a balance? I'm not, I'm not yeah. urging anyone to do that. Just for the record, not, I'm curious as to what the checks and balances are. Yeah, so we do have a, a, a quality program. We have a duplication program. So we get Mickey Mouse. We get, you know, 
Actually, Star you know, Wars I characters. I stop myself from yeah, saying yeah. that. <laughs> so we get those every decade. Um, again, we they may fall into a follow-up to see if we can get actual information. Name isn't as big of a deal as you know, date of birth, race and ethnicity, age data, that's what's really important for right. planning purposes for the next 10 years. All right, but there is a quality control yep, and you absolutely. do have a way, uh, I'm sure you have lots of thousands of people looking over the yep. responses. Okay, yep. anybody else? I had the experience of listening to a census data. Uh, you have to convey the impression that they have so much power that when they go out, they are relentless in getting the information that they try to get. Uh, now, this might be a good thing in one sense, mm -hmm. but there are people who are working from the back, and they, they are of the opinion that um, there are people who are trying to form below and they work with a vengeance to extract this information on the pain of penalty from folks. How do you mitigate that kind of behavior? How do you control that kind of behavior by census statements with that aggressive trying to prove a point? Yeah, a great question. I'm trying to literally criminalize people. Yeah, so it, it is required by law. Uh, the census is required by law that you fill it out completely and accurately, but we're not a regulatory agency. We don't go after people if they don't. We instead try to focus on the importance of the census, what it means to the community, what their response will mean to that community for the next 10 years. We try to hire locally. People understand, you know, people who live in the community understand the community better than anyone else. So our goal is to hire locally. So they understand the communication, they understand you know, the, uh, any cultural um, thresholds, they, they need to make sure they don't over, overstep, things like that. If you find someone or you hear about a, a census worker that's, that is going beyond what they should be doing, that's when you let us know and then we can take some type of action. And we'll provide you with contact information that you can reach out to us directly. Any other questions? Mr. Baylor, I just want to reiterate uh, what the borough president said. Uh, the, her Queens Complete Count Committee um, has been working very closely with you for the last year. Uh, we look forward to the next year's work of partnership. Um, your staff are ubiquitous. We see them everywhere. And a reminder to the, the chairs and the district managers, if you have street fairs, if you have events in your communities um, where you would like a presence from the bureau, uh, they've been more than willing ready and able uh, to table and to be available with information um, on the streets. And so please use them because yep. um, they certainly have never said no to us here at Borough Hall. So thank you very much thank for your you. presentation. I that. Yes. That would be yep. really key. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. Um, and on. And on that note, I wanted to remind everyone it is summer. Uh, the borough president hosts her annual Cats concert series. Uh, so they are coming to a neighborhood park near you. We look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and otherwise, if there are no other items on the agenda, we will close the meeting. The next meeting of the Queensboro Board will take place Monday, September 16, 2019 at 530 followed by the meeting of the Queensboro Cabinet uh, the following morning on Tuesday, September 17th, 9.30 a.m. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.